All right, and welcome back to your lab on blood vessels. Now, one of the first things the students say when they see the blood vessels is, holy crap, there's a lot of blood vessels. But take it easy, because if you're, if you're in my lab, we're probably only going to make you memorize somewhere between 40 and 50 blood vessels. The other thing is, just last semester, you mastered 206 bones in the body, plus all the processes, fossa, and stuff like this. So you've got this. You can definitely do blood vessels. So the model we're going to use today is the SOMSO uh, circulatory system model. This is the one that was on a green background previously. Uh, it's not completely 100% accurate, but it's probably one of the more detailed circulatory system models that we have in the anatomy lab. So that's the one we're going to use today. Now keep in mind that some of the blood vessels are misidentified in the key for this model, and we might have disagreements elsewhere. So if you disagree on how I'm classifying a blood vessel, be sure to uh, send me a note down in the comments and I will adjust the presentation or at least put errata down in the comments. So uh, on with the presentation. Now before we go on to talk about the different blood vessels in the body, we need to go over a few key concepts that can be helpful in memorizing blood vessels. Firstly, arteries and veins. What's the difference? Well, arteries carry blood away from the heart, veins bring blood back to the heart. Now, in models, the arteries tend to be red and the veins tend to be blue, but there are exceptions. Remember, the pulmonary artery and pulmonary trunk bring oxygen-poor blood away from the heart to the lungs, so they're going to be blue, and by the same token, the pulmonary veins uh, are going to be red because they have oxygen-rich blood. Okay, arteries and veins generally travel together. It's usually artery, vein, and nerve. So if you find an area where the artery is and the artery has this name, the vein may have that name too, or it may not. Okay, also arteries and veins are often named for the bones that they're running adjacent to. For example, we have the radial artery running down the outside of the arm there over the radius bone. We have the ulnar artery as well, and we also have a radial and ulnar vein. On the other hand, sometimes blood vessels are named for the organs they supply. For example, the splenic artery and the hepatic artery are named for those organs. And finally, here's the maddening thing. The names of arteries and veins oftentimes change after those arteries branch. And as you know, these blood vessels branch a whole lot. So let me give you an analogy. So this is a road on the windward side of Oahu. Okay, over on this side, you can see we have the Pali Highway that travels across uh, the mountains and then it weaves around this way. And then once we get to some place called Castle Junction, uh, it meets up with another road called Kamehameha Highway and then it ceases to be Pali Highway. Beyond that, it becomes Kalani Ani Oli Highway and then beyond that, it becomes Kailua Road. So it's very, very maddening because the names do change and it's the same concept with blood vessels. All right, we're going to start out today by learning the arteries that are in the head and thorax. So first of all, the major artery leaving the heart is the aorta. Remember, the aorta has an ascending part that's going up, an arch that travels across, and then a descending part, which is going down. Now, two other arteries we have in the heart are the pulmonary trunk, which is right here, leaving the right ventricle and going towards the lungs and branching off into the pulmonary arteries, which again, take that oxygen poor blood to the lungs. Now we're going to go back and take a look at the aorta and the three vessels that it gives rise to. So first, let's look on the right-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have something called a brachiocephalic trunk. Brachio here means arm, and cephalic means head. So trunk is like a trunk on a tree. This is something that is going to give rise to branches. And one of those branches is going to go to the arm, and that initially will be called the subclavian artery. And we call it subclavian because it travels below the clavicle. So we have a subclavian artery, and the other branch of that brachiocephalic trunk is going to be the common carotid artery, which we can see up here. So common carotid means that it hasn't branched yet. There's going to be an internal and external uh, carotid later on. So again, brachiocephalic trunk gives rise to one vessel that goes to the head, the cephalos, and then one that goes to the arm, and that is initially called the subclavian artery. Now, let's take a look at the other two vessels that are coming off the aorta here. The next one is the uh, left uh, common carotid. Now, this is different than the right one because the right one came off a brachiocephalic trunk. This one does not. It rises directly off the aorta, and again, that's going to carry blood uh, to the head, and the head is where we have the brain and stuff like that. Okay, and then that is going to branch off 
uh, into an internal and external. We're not showing them here because they're kind of reversed on this model. But suffice it to say, the external is eventually going to become uh, part of this superficial temporal artery. Uh, and then we're also going to have an occipital branch as well. We have a maxillary or facial branch uh, as well too. So lots of superficial blood vessels uh, around the face. Now let's take a look at that third blood vessel that arose from the aorta. And that blood vessel was called the subclavian artery. So this is the left subclavian artery. And again, it's that third branch off the aorta. And remember, subclavian means it's going underneath the clavicle. Now, just like those roads that change names depending on the branching, uh, this is eventually going to become the axillary artery. So axillary region is the armpit. So once we get in the armpit, we're called the axillary artery. And eventually down here, we become the brachial artery. So brachial here means arm. But it was all one big vessel that branched a little bit, but it's still the same vessel. But its name changes based on the location. All right, now let's follow those arteries a little bit further down into the appendages. So on the right-hand side, you can see that we have the uh, deep artery of the arm. And again, some textbooks don't show this. Uh, our textbook happens to show this, so deep artery of the arm. And then we have our brachial artery. And then on the other side, we have the ulnar collateral artery. And the way I memorize this is DBU, or deadbeat uncle. And that helps me memorize the three branches. We have the deep artery of the arm. We have the brachial artery, which is the major artery in there. And then we have the ulnar collateral artery. Now, if we go distal from the brachial artery, we can see the artery continues to branch. So we have three branches here. We have a radial branch that makes up the radial artery. We have an interosseous branch, which goes between the radius and the ulna. And we have a uh, ulnar branch right here. So radial and ulnar arteries. And the radial artery is the one that you palpate uh, with your fingers right there to take your pulse. OK, distal to the radial and ulnar arteries, we have two arcuate-looking arteries called the deep palmar branch and the superficial palmar branch. And those give rise to the digital arteries, which are right there, and supply the fingers. All right, now that we covered the arteries of the head and thorax, we're going to go back and cover some of the veins. Now, oftentimes, these veins uh, run parallel to the arteries and have the same names, but that's not always the case. OK, first, let's look at the major vein leaving the heart. And those two major veins were right here, the vena cava, which brings blood back to the right atrium. And the other major veins we have right here are the pulmonary veins, which bring blood to the uh, left atrium once it's been oxygenated in the lungs. So we're going to follow what happens uh, above the superior vena cava. And what we can see here is we have two branches there called brachiocephalic veins. Now, this is similar to what we had in the arteries, except these are never called trunks. We just call these brachiocephalic veins. And again, the reason is these blood vessels are going to branch, and one of the branches is going to the head, the other branches is going to the arm. So the branches that go to the arm are going to be called the subclavian veins. Okay, subclavian travels underneath the clavicle. And then the branch that goes to the head is going to be called the jugular vein. So right now we can just see the internal jugular, but there's also an external jugular as well. And just like the carotid artery gave rise to many of the arteries in the face and the head, the same thing happens with the jugular vein. The jugular vein gives rise to things like the facial veins, uh, to the superficial temporal veins, and the occipital veins as well. So now that we covered the veins that supply the neck and head, let's go back and talk about the veins that are in the arm. Now remember, our subclavian vein was that vein running underneath the clavicle. It's going to branch off, and when we get in the armpit, we're going to call it the axillary vein. So axilla just means the armpit here. Now the axillary vein is going to branch off, and we're going to have uh, a superficial branch called the cephalic vein. So the cephalic vein is a superficial vein on the outside of the arm. And then we're going to have a deeper uh, brachial vein. And then beyond that, we're going to have an internal, very superficial vein, which is called the basilic vein. So basilic here sort of means like snake-like. So just like we did with the arteries, we're going to follow the blood vessels of the arm more distally so we can learn the names of the different blood vessels that are in the hand and wrist. So first of all, remember the outside of the arm there was our cephalic uh, vein, and that is a very superficial vein. We also have a superficial vein on the inside of the arm, and remember that was called the basilic vein. Now, if we go more proximally, we can see something called the median cubital vein, and that's located right here uh, in your sort of anticubital space right there. And this is a prime venipuncture site where we can put an IV or something like that, where we do blood draws, et cetera. So that's why the median cubital vein is a vein that you should know. OK, beyond that, we look like we have a radial and ulnar vein, but I don't think that's what it is on this model. 
the radial and ulnar vein are actually more medial than these two veins are pictured, and they're also more deep. So these veins are superficial, they're on the outside, so these are just continuations of our cephalic vein on the left side and of our basilic vein on the right side. So we can't really see the radial and ulnar vein in this shot. And finally, just like we did with arteries, distal to the carpus, we have some digital veins right here. Digital veins are feeding the digits or the phalanges. All right, now we're going to shift gears and learn all the major blood vessels in the abdominal cavity. And look at that, right? It looks like spaghetti. It's very scary looking. But we're going to go through this systematically and learn each of the major blood vessels in just a few minutes. Okay, first off, what blood vessel do we have right here? Well, you probably remember that is the abdominal aorta. Remember the aorta first went up and then it went down, was descending aorta. Once it gets into the abdomen, we call it the abdominal aorta. Now, there are three singular connections coming off that aorta. By singular, I mean there's no bilateral symmetrical. It's just one after the other. So first off, let's take a look at those three uh, connections. And they are called the celiac trunk up top, the superior mesenteric, and then the inferior mesenteric. Now the celiac trunk, we're going to see in a minute, is a trunk that branches into a lot of different branches that supply the liver and the stomach and things like that. So we'll come back to that. And then we have the uh, mesenterics, right? Superior and inferior. And these are supplying the intestines with oxygen-rich blood. So they eventually connect our anastomose together. So superior and inferior mesenteric. Now let's go back and look at that celiac trunk. So coming off the celiac trunk, uh, one of the first things you're going to see is that we have a right. uh, gastric artery. Gastric artery goes on the upper side of the stomach there. And then we see something called the common hepatic artery. Common here means an artery before it branches and divides into something else. So the common hepatic artery is going to branch and give rise to the hepatic artery proper, which goes to the liver, and it's also going to give rise to the left gastric down here. And then finally, our last branch of the celiac trunk is uh, going to the spleen. So it's the splenic artery, which again goes to the spleen and supplies it with oxygen-rich blood. Now below the celiac trunk, we still have some more arteries we need to talk about, but these are paired arteries. And the first of these are the renal arteries. So we have a left and right a renal artery, uh, and these supply the kidneys with oxygen-rich blood. The kidneys are generally getting about 25% of your cardiac output at any one time, so we have a tremendous amount of blood flow going to the kidneys, because their job, of course, is to filter the blood. Now, uh, inferior to that, we have a gonadal artery and would have a gonadal vein as well. So these are blood vessels that are traveling off the aorta, they're paired, and they're going down to either the ovaries for females or the testes for males. Okay, now let's look at the branching of the aorta uh, inferiorly. And so what you can see right now is the abdominal aorta branches into what we call something called the common iliac artery. So common here represents a vessel before it's going to branch. So we know that the common iliac artery is going to branch, and when it does, it's going to make an internal iliac artery, which is right here, and then an external iliac artery right there. So think about the name iliac. What does iliac stand for? Well, it means ilium. And right here we have the ilium bone, right, which is a big part of the hip bones. All right, now we're going to cover the veins of the abdominal cavity just like we did the arteries. So starting out, the largest vein in the abdominal cavity is the vena cava. So this is our inferior vena cava right here, and it leads to the right atrium of the heart. Now the inferior vena cava branches and supplies other organs here. We can see that it drains blood from the liver via the hepatic veins. It also has something called a hepatic portal vein. The hepatic portal vein doesn't connect directly to the vena cava, but what it does do is it connects between the liver and the intestines. And so nutrients that are absorbed from the intestines can travel directly to the capillary beds in the liver. And that's where we have a lot of exciting stuff going on, such as conversion of carbohydrates into fats, etc. All right, the next blood vessels we're going to learn about are the superior and inferior mesenteric veins. So remember, the mesenteric arteries were the ones that supplied the intestines with oxygen-rich blood, and these are going to be draining the intestines of sort of the used blood so they can travel back to the heart and eventually get to the lungs again. Okay, we also have a splenic vein, which drains the spleen, and we also have a renal vein, which drains the kidneys as well. Remember, kidneys are getting a lot of blood, and that blood is being filtered and then returned to the body via the renal veins. Okay, just like the aorta branched, the inferior vena cava is going to branch as well. And remember, we call that branch the common iliac. 
So this first branch is the common iliac vein, and that branches off into an internal and external iliac vein. And once again, that's named for the bone right here in the hip, which is the ilium. So first off, we have our external iliac artery. Remember, it's called iliac because it lies adjacent to the ilium. Now, once we get down into the thigh, that's going to branch off, and we're going to have a femoral artery right there, which is named, of course, for the femur. And then we're going to have something called a deep femoral artery. And I have two different locations penned here. Uh, the upper location is what your textbook indicates. The lower location is what the key on the model indicates. So I'll leave it to you or your instructor to decide which one is correct. Okay, above that we have something called the ascending branch of the lateral circumflex artery, and that is a mouthful. So first of all, let's break that down. Ascending means it's going up, that's true, and circumflex here means that it's surrounding a bone, and then lateral means it's on the outside and not the inside. And so if we have an ascending, we must also have a descending, and that's what we have right here. Okay, we have a descending uh, limb of the lateral circumflex artery, which is going down uh, towards the knee. Okay, we said before that the femoral artery was the major artery of the thigh, and if we follow that artery down into the knee, it's going to be called the popliteal artery. So the popliteal artery lies in the popliteal fossa, which is located in the back of the knee. All right, so the veins of the hip and thigh are very similar to the arteries and their location and also their names. So let's start out with the iliac vein. So this is the external iliac vein, and then that is going to branch off into a femoral vein. But before we get there, I want to show you those ascending and descending branches of the lateral circumflex veins in this case. And now let's take a look at the femoral vein. The femoral vein is the major vein of the thigh, just like the femoral artery was the major artery. We also have a second vein here called the great saphenous vein. And saphenous vein is a very superficial vein on the inside of the thigh. It's located very close to the surface. And this is a blood vessel that we'll actually harvest in cases when we need to do a cardiac bypass graft. And that's where we have an occluded blood vessel uh, in the carotid arteries, and we therefore take a little bit of this uh, saphenous vein and replace it or go around the obstruction so that we can restore blood flow to the heart. Okay, home stretch time. Now it's time to tackle the blood vessels of the lower legs. So first off, let's start with the popliteal artery. Remember the popliteal artery was an extension of the femoral artery. And that's going to extend distally, and it's going to branch off to become a fibular or peroneal branch, as well as a posterior tibial branch. Now, posterior tibial uh, basically infers that we're going to have an anterior tibial, and that's correct. So on the front of the shin, we have an anterior tibial artery, and that artery eventually gives rise to the dorsal pedis artery, or pedis dorsalis. Um, and this is the major blood vessel in the top of the foot. On the bottom of the foot, we have a plantar artery, again, named for the plantar surface as well. And those arteries branch off to form something called arcuate arteries. So the arcuate arteries are named for the fact that they occur in an arc, and this is sometimes called a plexus. And then these arteries are going to branch and give rise to our dorsal metatarsal arteries of the foot, and eventually to the arteries in the digits themselves. So now that we've covered all the major arteries and the legs, you might be saying, well, what about all that mess up there? We are going there. We're going to go tackle this mess that's up in the knee. So again, here we jump off of uncharted territory. There's no key in this model for what's going on in the knee, uh, so we have to consult various references, and most textbooks don't actually talk about the blood vessels in here, so we'll do our best to identify what they are. So first, let's take a look laterally, and we have the descending branch of the lateral circumflex artery here, and we've seen that before. And then on this side, the model has it marked here as being something called the superficial femoral artery. Well, if you check out your textbook, they probably don't talk anything about something called the superficial femoral artery. It's probably best just to call it the femoral artery, but just letting you know that uh, some people call it superficial because there is a deep artery of the femur as well. All right, and then we have these blood vessels which are called genicular arteries. You're like, what does that mean? Well, genicular basically means knee, and so we're talking about the knee here. So we have a superior medial genicular artery and a superior lateral genicular artery. We have an inferior lateral genicular artery and an inferior medial genicular artery. And then in between all these, we have something called the patellar plexus or patellar anastomosis. So this is where we have a lot of different blood vessels that are joining together, and that's exactly what an anastomosis is, an area where blood vessels converge. And last but not least, on the lateral side, we have the circumflex fibular branch of the anterior tibial artery, and that is a mouthful, so let's break it down. 
First of all, remember the anterior tibial artery runs this way, and a circumflex branch here is going to wrap around uh, the top of the bone, which is the fibula. So circumflex means it wraps around the bone. All right, last slide. The last thing we have to do is master the veins that are in the lower leg. Well, fortunate for you, so and so didn't see fit to put a whole lot of veins in this model, so there's not a lot of veins to cover. So firstly, on the inside of the leg right here in the calf, we have the great saphenous vein. Remember, that's a superficial vein on the inside of the leg. And then on the other side, we can see something called the small saphenous vein. So a small saphenous vein is just a smaller uh, external vein there. And just like we saw with the arteries in the foot, we're going to have a dorsal venous arch right here. So dorsal venous arch, and that's where those blood vessels are going to converge, and they're going to give rise to the uh, blood vessels of the metatarsals and eventually the phalanges. So there you have it. We've done the circulatory system in hopefully under 15 minutes. So if you're having problems, go back and review this video again and work with the models that I've given you uh, in your virtual laboratory.